Good morning, Full Life family. Anybody glad to be in church this morning? Come on, put your hands together. Isn't it great to be, be able to worship God and just worship Jesus? We just want to say how grateful we are, thankful for our guests this morning. We're glad you're here today. We hope you've already experienced the presence of God. Hey, a whole, a Full Life family, can we give them a good hand one more time? Yeah. Uh, do me one more favor. Can we welcome those who are watching us online? We want to thank you for joining in. Yeah. We hope you've experienced the presence of God. So, you know, I, I got a couple of things I want to mention today, uh, some, some things that make me proud as a pastor. Number one, uh, yesterday, Dwayne and Leanne, our newest staff members, moved in their new house. And thank God for that, finally. I know Dwayne and Leanne are, are really excited about that. But we had some awesome people from our church to step up today, or yesterday, and help out. As a matter of fact, one of the couples, it was their anniversary, and they sacrificed and came and helped all day long uh, just to help Dwayne and Leanne. Can we give our, our full life people a good hand this morning? Isn't it great? And then just, just to see uh, how you guys are loving on people in the community, you know, never alone and all those things. It's just, it just really, really does my heart good to, to see you guys just serve and love the way Christ does. A couple of things real quick. Remember, we have these two resources for you. Uh, as Tim mentioned, we do have this prayer journal. would love for you to be a part of the 21 days of prayer that we've been doing. We're in week two, starting today, week two, and we're doing a daily prayer focus. You can take one of these today. They're on the back table. Join with us in prayer. We have a 6 a.m., prayer service and a 7 a.m. prayer service Monday through Friday and then of course this Saturday the one that he mentioned all day long you can come and, and go as your as your pl pleasure but listen folks there's there's power in prayer amen so let's get one of those and then also we're, we're in a series called the book of Romans and we've given you these journals these are free to you you can take those read along with us uh, ch my challenge is that you read the whole book of Romans over the next couple of months and there's an opportunity for you to, to journal inside of here. These are free to you, thanks to your generosity. Amen. And so take one of those as you leave as well. So, yes, we're in week two of the series on the book of Romans. And last week, here's kind of a summarization of last week. We talked about how that we need a, a really a comprehensive view of who God is for us to appreciate the gospel. And so we talked about how that God is holy, that he is perfect in all he does, and that because he's holy and we compare ourselves to him, there's this really big gap between us and him because of our own sin. We also talked about how that God is just, that he will carry out the, the consequences of our sin. But the good thing is, not only is he holy and just, but he's merciful. Aren't you glad he's merciful this morning? That he didn't make you carry out the sentence or the consequence. He took that consequence upon himself. That should make somebody shout this morning that God has been so merciful. And he's gracious that not only does he not count your sin against you, but now he gives you his favor. Aren't you glad for favor today? That his, he smiles on you. He loves you. He has compassion for you. And so when you understand the fullness of the character of God, you appreciate the gospel that much more. And then we also talked about how that, that the book of Romans is centered around that idea of the gospel, which is good news. Everybody say good news. So the good news is Jesus Christ came, lived a sinless life, died a cruel death on the cross, and he walked out of the tomb so you and I could live this victorious Christian life that we have before us. Amen, everybody. And so those are the, the, some of the things we talked about last week, that even though that we are unrighteous before God, whether we're, you know, some of you, you lived before Christ, you were just a total hellion, right? You did everything and anything, right? Does that describe anybody in this room today? Or maybe you were that self-righteous person who never did anything wrong, and you thought, well, that's, that's going to do the trick for me. I've never killed anybody. I never robbed a bank. I never cheated on my taxes. And the truth is, even though you've never done those things, before God, you're still unrighteous. So that's some bad news for all of us, right? But the good news is, it doesn't matter where you find yourself, either really religious or really off the, off the tracks, there's still grace and mercy. Amen. So Romans 3 starts out continuing some of the bad news, but there's this shift that happens in the middle of it. We'll get to there, but, but I want you to understand something first as we go through this. And, and just close your eyes for a second. Everybody close your eyes. And you picture um, 
the, the Apostle Paul, who was the one who wrote Romans, in a courtroom, all right? And he's standing in this courtroom, and he's making, he's like a lawyer. He's defending this idea of the gospel. Now, there are people in, sitting in the, in the crowd there that are they're religious, they're Jews, and they're, they're like, I'm not sure that I can really believe what you're saying, okay? And so what he does is he's going to present this case. Can you see it? He's, he's standing before these people, and he's presenting this case of the gospel. Okay, you can open your eyes again. Do you see it now? So he's standing before, and he's having to answer questions about this gospel that he's presenting, this truth. Because remember, in the book of Romans, he's speaking to not only Gentiles, but he's speaking to Jewish people who would have this long history of believing just because they're, they're Jews, that they're okay with God, that if they obey the laws, that they're okay. And that's the, not the case. And so the truth is, as Paul states it, we know we were sinners because of the law, but watch this. What does it say? The law can't save us. And I'm going to show you what, how Paul lays this argument out. He's, remember, he's in this courtroom. All right, let's read verse 9, chapter 3. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all, if I say all, under the power of what? Sin. As it is written. Now this is, he's quoting from the, the Old Testament here, okay? All these next few verses are Old Testament passages where he, he's, again, he's making a case about this. There is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Boy, that's some bad news, isn't it? Pretty bleak. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The, the poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world accountable to God. You see this, that the law wasn't going to save the Jews. All it was going to do was make them aware of their sin. Do y'all see that? That's what Paul's saying here, that in, in God's sight, We've all broken the law because it's a standard that we really can't uphold. And that's the reason that, that we have to understand the beauty of grace is because we cannot do it on our own. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight, watch this, by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, what happens? We become conscious of our sin. And so Paul is giving us this argument that the law is okay. it's good, but there's a misunderstanding of how it's used. See, some people think if I just live up to these commandments, I'm in right standing with God. That's not the case. But what the law does, the Ten Commandments does, what does it do? Oh, when I look at it, well, I'm a murderer. Well, I never killed anybody. Well, but what did Jesus say? He said, if you hate a person without a cause, you're already guilty of murder. That's bad news, isn't it? Or he says, don't commit adultery. Oh, well, I've never committed adultery, but Jesus said, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. So the problem is, we can't live up to this. All we can do is realize and acknowledge, I, I, I can't do this. That's a good place for you to be in. A way better place for you to be in than, oh, I'm, I can do this. I can pull myself up by my bootstraps because the gospel says otherwise. The gospel says I need a Savior, right? And so, so what happens here is, is our understanding of the gospel positions us to really understand fully God's imputed righteousness. Now, that, that word imputed is kind of a fancy theological term. All it means is... Our, our account, our bank account was in the negative. Anybody ever re re realize that? Our spiritual account is in the negative. That's bad news. How many of you get this bad news? It's red all over. 
But God says, let me bring this account up to zero. Anybody glad for that this morning? That's what he means when he says, I've imputed my righteousness to you. That before God, it's as if you'd never sinned at all. I love that, don't you? Anybody glad for that this morning? And so I love this, this uh, I was, I'm, one of my favorite preachers is a guy named Skip Heitzig. He does a great job just verse by verse looking at the Word of God. And I was listening to him this week. And he made, a, he made this statement. He said, make sure that Jesus is your advocate. He's your judge. He's your lawyer. Aren't you glad he's your lawyer this morning? Because he has this, this kinship with the Father. Aren't you glad he has kinship with the Father? That he is the one who goes to the Father on our behalf. Aren't you glad he's your advocate today? The Bible calls him his, our great high priest, that even this moment he's making intercession for us. That should be good news to you today. But I love this other quote. He says, he has taken the Jew and Gentile into the interrogation room and stripped them naked. In other words, every argument, every defense that they would have, he's just cast it aside. But he didn't leave you. Aren't you glad he didn't leave you there with no defense? That's where we stand before God without Jesus. You realize that, right? No defense. But then watch this. He says, then he takes them into the throne room and clothes them. Aren't you glad for that this morning? That he clothes us in the righteousness of Jesus. Aren't you glad for that? If you are, say amen this morning. So here's the second thing to consider as we're talking about this Romans 3 and 4. There, there are benefits to believing in Jesus for salvation. Would you agree there are benefits to believing on Jesus for salvation? There are some great benefits that that we, have, we now are no longer slaves, but we're sons and daughters of God. That we're no longer guilty before God, but now we've been declared righteous. That's good news. So here's where in chapter 3, it shifts from all the bad news we've been talking about the last two weeks into some really good news. And I want you to lean into this because these verses here... Um, are some of my favorite, and I hope they become yours too when you read this. Remember, what's your state before God? You're unrighteous. You're, you're, you have no defense. But watch what he says in verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. It's been revealed to us, to which the law and the prophets testify. In other words, all of the Old Testament was pointing to this reality that Jesus wants to make you righteous before God. Now watch this. This righteousness is given through faith. Everybody say faith. Faith in who? In Jesus Christ. To all who believe, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned. What does the word all mean? When you look in the original language, guess what all means? All. Everybody. Everybody. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody's excluded from that. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that Jesus came, came, that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Everybody say faith. These are key words, right? Faith, grace. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Now, I've been reading in my year, I do a year Bible every year, and I'm in the book of Leviticus. Anybody ever read the book of Leviticus? How many of you have read it before? It's an exciting book, isn't it? But you know what? When I read it, I begin to appreciate these verses all the more. Because right now, in the first few chapters, Moses describes what they had to do to, for their sins to be forgiven. And it was very meticulous. They would have to take a goat or a lamb, a perfect lamb, and they would have to slaughter this lamb. They would have to sacrifice this lamb once a year for their sins to be forgiven. And it had to happen annually. Why? Because according to the book of Hebrews, the blood of a goat or, or a lamb could not save you. 
Aren't you glad for the, the sacrificial lamb of Jesus, who the Bible talks about in Hebrews, once and for all, his blood forgives sin. Are you glad for that this morning? If you are, put your hands together this morning. Are you glad for that? Come on, I should, yeah, amen, amen. And so, so you see when you understand, even the Old Testament points to the Savior Jesus Christ, his blood atoning your sins, all right? And we'll talk about that word atone in just a second. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So there is the justice of God, the, the sentence for my sin and yours being carried out on Jesus. Wherein then is the boasting? It's excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Good news. What does it say? Yes, he is the God of the Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. And so, Paul's not discounting the, the value of the law. He just wants us to see a clear picture of, of how it's used. And I've already talked about that. But there are three words I want to bring to your attention today. And these are pretty theological terms, but, but I want to try to help you understand these terms as it as it helps you to understand your, your state before God and what, what Christ accomplished at the cross. The first one is called justification. Anybody ever heard that word justification? What does it mean? Simply put, just as if you had never sinned. Isn't that beautiful? It's, it's a legal term where God is saying to us, yeah, I know you sinned and, and I know that that you have broken my commands, but I'm going to pro proclaim you as if you'd never sinned. Man, that's good news. He puts that, his credit to our account, his death, his resurrection to our account. He makes this declaration, you are justified by faith because of what Jesus did. Are you glad for that this morning? just as if you'd never sinned. And then the second one is redemption. Now this, this term, if you can picture a, a person that's, that, was, that was actually a slave, right? And a person comes up to this market where this slave is being traded, they're being bought, and they say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay the price for this slave to go free. Would you call that person generous? Absolutely you would. That's what Jesus did for me and you. We were slaves to our sin. We were bound up in chains. And what did Jesus do? Let me purchase their freedom. How did he do that? With his own blood. See, the, the, the Bible says that Jesus became a ransom for me and you. His blood shed to pay the penalty for our sins, to set us free. Aren't you glad this morning that you're free because of the blood of Jesus? Beautiful picture of the gospel. The third one is a word, it's a really fancy word, propitiation. Everybody ever heard that word before? Now this one can be misunderstood. This is really another legal term, but really what it means is that God's wrath on sin has been appeased. That that. Jesus Christ became the mercy seat. If you've ever studied the Old Testament and you studied the, the tabernacle where they, there was this place called the Holy of Holies and there was a, a box that God had the children of Israel build called the Ark of the Covenant. Anybody ever heard of the Ark of the Covenant? Anybody ever watched Raiders of the Lost Ark? That's, that's the box that he was searching for, right? And so the Ark of the Covenant, there was this place on the, on the Ark of the Covenant called the mercy seat. And when the, the priests would go in once a year, they would, they would kill the blood of the lamb and they would put it on the mercy seat. And the Bible says that God would meet with him right there. Aren't you glad now 
that the mercy seat is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we can meet with God because of what he did for us. And so now this word takes on a whole new meaning that, that Jesus Christ's blood appeased God's wrath, and now you and I can have fellowship and communion with the God we love. Amen. Isn't that good news? It's great news that we have this privilege of sons and daughters now. Now, let me say this. There are those of you who struggle with guilt and shame of your past. You cannot quite let go of what you used to do. And over and over again, you beat yourself up. Even though you've placed your faith in Christ and what he's done for you. Let me say this. Let it go. Christ has already forgiven you. Amen? As a matter of fact, the Bible says he's cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. He's never going to remember them again. Why should you? Especially if you have placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus. Because here's what happens. If you, if you continue to, to beat yourself up in and, and the shame and guilt, what you're saying is, in your opinion, I don't believe God did, really did it for me. And you're really living way below your privilege as a son or daughter of God. Do you see that, folks? That your privilege as a son or daughter of God, you have access to God. You have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. And now you can go to Daddy God. Come on, somebody. Listen, when I, when I was younger and my dad would come in the room, you know, I, I, would, I would love to just run up and get in his lap. Anybody love to do that with their dad? Because I knew he loved me. I knew he had, he had the best in mind for me. That's the way your heavenly father is. He loves you so much, he sent his one and only son to die on the cross to bleed so you could have access to God. Come on, somebody. That's good news today. That's the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as a follower of Jesus, you can lay hold to all of this. But it's not anything that you've done. It's by faith. Everybody say faith one more time. Say it. Say faith. Faith in who? In Christ. This is what saves you folks. It's not trying to do better. It's not, you know, helping little old ladies across the street, which is great. You need to be doing that. But there's a difference between the faith that saves you and the faith that you work. That's after the fact. That's a result of what, you, what God's already done on the inside. And so should you be helping old ladies across the street? Absolutely you should. Should you be giving to the church? Absolutely you should. Should you be telling people? Should you be helping people in certain Absolutely you should. But you need to understand that's not what's going to save you. It's your faith in the finished work of Jesus that saves you. I want to make that crystal clear. Does everybody understand that this morning? It's a faith that saves. Now, I love it because many people have, I think they have a misconception about the Old Testament. And we always hear that the Old Testament, God's the God of wrath and, and all that. Yes, he did pour out his wrath. But you've got to understand something. Remember, he's a holy God. And he's totally justified because his anger is not a, this, this, like you and I. Like, I'm angry at somebody with, even without a, a cause. No, he's holy and so his anger is totally because he sees the evil in the world. And he says, i got to do something about it. Anybody ever been angry before? Why were you angry? Because you, listen, you saw some kind of injustice, right? There was something you saw and you said in your heart, that's not right. Am I right? And because you did that, you were angry. What's well, the same thing with God? God's looking down on all humanity in the Old Testament, and they're, they're doing all kinds of stuff. They're sacrificing babies on, on these hot iron idols. They're, they're, they're doing everything against the will of God. And so what, what's happened? He's like, this is not right. Remember, he's holy. And remember, he's just. And so even in the Old Testament... There's this picture of righteousness with God by faith. And there are two characters in the Bible. Anybody ever heard of Abraham? If you've heard of Abraham, say amen. So Abraham is the father of three religions, right? Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. 
which I like to say Christianity is really not a religion. It's about a relationship with the God who created you, right? But you see in the Old Testament, I want to read this to you. This is Paul talking, Romans 4. We're heading into chapter 4 now. What shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? Remember, he's still talking about uh, this salvation, this righteousness by faith, not works, okay? Y'all with me? In fact, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he would have something to boast about, but not before God. See, that's our, that's our nature. If we could do this ourselves, we'd go around bragging about it, wouldn't we? But the humility that we understand that we can't, that's what leads us to repentance. What does Scripture say? Abraham, everybody say it with me. Believe God and it was what? Credit to him as righteous. Listen, folks, this is before Jesus. This is before even the law was given. The Bible says that Abraham was counted righteous before God because of his faith. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. In other words, listen, when you go to work and you work 40 hours and you get a paycheck, is that a gift? No. That's, you earn that. But what we're talking about is this, this thing that we can't earn. It's a gift, the gift of righteousness. However, to the one who does not work but trusts God, who, is, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as what? Say it loud. Righteousness. David says the same thing. Okay, we're, we, we switch from Abraham to David now. You guys know who David was? I don't want to take it for granted. Everybody knows. David was the, one of the best kings Israel ever had. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. And he understood something, that he was sinful. Remember his, his uh, antics with Bathsheba? And his antics of killing Bathsheba's husband? He's an adulterer and a murderer. And watch what it says. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Now, these verses here are out of Psalm 32, where David is actually thanking God that he's forgiven his sin with Bathsheba. Now watch what he says. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Can we stop and say thank you for that today? That word blessed, you know what it means? You may know what it means. Happy. Happy are those is the one whose sin the Lord will never account against him. Next verse. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if, in tho- if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, nothing, and the promise is worthless. Because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace, and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He's the father of all. Now, if you remember anything about the Old Testament, you remember Really, the first encounter that Abraham had with God. You know, Abraham was, he was not a, he's not a Jew, right? He was the father of the Jews, but before he met God, he was, he was a Gentile. He was like far from God. He was a, he worshiped other gods. But God says to him, hey, I want to make you a great nation. I want to bless you. And so he takes Abraham outside. And he says, in the night, it's at nighttime. Have you, has anybody ever been to places where there's not light pollution? And you see the stars. How many of you have seen that before? Like you're up in the mountains somewhere where there's not a lot of light. What is it, what's it like? Stars galore. I mean, everywhere you look is a star. We can't see them because of all the light pollution. But they're there, right, nonetheless. And so he takes Abraham out. There's no light pollution. So he sees all these numerous stars. And God says to Abraham, take a look. All of these stars represent this great nation I'm going to build. And I'm going to bless all people because of you. That's a great promise, right? That 
God made this promise to Abraham thousands of years ago that he would make a great nation. I believe he looked ahead and saw a group of people sitting at Full Life Church, amen, on a Sunday morning, August 18th, 11th, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself here, on August 11th, that we would be studying the Bible and we would be in awe of the fact that God included all of those who would have faith in this wonderful thing we call righteousness and salvation. It's beautiful, isn't it? And so Paul, his argument, remember he's making this argument to Jewish people. Hey, this guy that you, you placed such favor on, Abraham, God gave him a revelation of righteousness by faith, not of works. And so what happens is you and I can celebrate today these two wonderful Old Testament examples. Listen, I believe these two are proof that Jesus had in mind for us from the foundation of the world, salvation. That there is a way that you and I, even today, if you've never accepted Christ, if you've never placed your faith in him, today there's this opportunity for you and I to walk in a close relationship with Jesus. And it's not based on the good thing that you've done. It's based on the goodness of Jesus. Is anybody glad for the goodness of Jesus today? Some of you, I think, have, a, have had a wrong picture of God up to this point. You've seen him as this wrathful, mean God. I believe that's a deception of the enemy. I believe that if you'll let him, he'll change your picture of him. And you can see him as a loving and a gracious father. And if you'll turn your heart to him, I believe you can come to faith in him today and, and just enjoy this wonderful. Here's how we say it around here. Christ came to give us a full life in Christ. Do you believe that today? I also think this, this is true as well. So we have, we have this these two groups of people, and, and some, I think it's representative of everybody in this room today. Some of you think that, you know, God's grace is, is awesome, and so I can, you know, I can say, hey, I, I believe in, in God, and then live however you want to. You know anybody like that? That's devastating, because that's a wrong picture. But the other wrong picture is this. It's kind of how I grew up. I just, you know, I got to live this way. I got to. It's almost like it's, I'm striving to live for God. And it's so hard, and I can't do it. And you've, you've been around some people like that. Well, I, woe is me. Anybody ever been around someone like that? Or they're just so legalistic that they're just mean. Anybody know any mean, mean Christians? Now, I see some hands go up. They never smile. You think they've been sucking on lemons for two weeks, right? Anybody around? You've seen these kind of people. And everything, I mean, everything is about, I, I don't smoke, I don't cuss, I don't run with people who do that kind of stuff. And it's all about the outward. Listen, folks, both of those are devastating. Why? Because they're not the complete picture of God. Amen. God does expect us to live for him once we're Christians. But it's not a legalistic thing where we're sad and we're always mad at somebody. And then it's over here. It's not, well, I'll just do whatever I want because God's gracious. That's not how this works. There is accountability. And so when you understand, first of all, the weight of your sin, how unrighteous you are before God, no matter how, where, where you are, who you are, where you're from, what your background is, if you understand this is your state before God because of your lack of knowing Jesus, you're in trouble. But if you'll say, God, I understand how sinful I am. How many times I've broken your commandments. I feel the weight of that. And I recognize 
that the gap between me and you is really, it's big. Because you're holy. When I begin to recognize that, here's the beautiful picture, folks. Because of what Jesus did at the cross, what happens to the gap? It closes. The gospel says this. I'll meet you where you are. With all your stuff. Anybody got some stuff? We all should lift our hands. We, got some, we all got stuff. And Jesus says, I'll meet you right here where you are. All your junk. All your past sin, I'll meet you right here. And if you'll place your faith in me, I'll clean you up. I'll wash you. As the Bible says, your sins, though they be as scarlet. What's the next line? White as snow. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the gospel. This is the good news. And there are some of you in this room, he wants to meet you right here and right now. What's your response today? There needs to be some realizations today, right? You need to realize. You need to come to this conclusion, this aha moment. First of all, that aren't you glad God thought you valuable enough to die for you today? You see that word propitiation, that word redemption? It's an, it's an idea of value. That you were created in the image of God. That he loves you so deep, deeply that he was willing to, t to pay this high price because he saw worth and value. How many of you believe that you're, you're valuable enough for him to die for? It's true. It's true. So realize that. Come to that conclusion. Number two, realize that because of Jesus, you stand justified as if you had never sinned. That's good news. Number three. Realize that Christ's death appeased the wrath of God and makes it possible for you to have communion with Him. I'm glad for that. That's the reason you and I could come in here today and sing, All the earth will shout you. The only way that you can do that is because God's wrath was appeased by Jesus' blood. Understand that the law serves the purpose of showing your sin, but it can't save you. It can't save you. But Jesus can. Number three, uh, last one, excuse me, number five. The work has been done by Christ. What's your job? Place your faith in the work that Jesus did. I remember a story years ago. There's a guy named um, Ken Blanchard. You, maybe you're, if you're in the business world, maybe you're familiar with him. He wrote a book called The One Minute Manager. Anybody familiar with that book? Very popular book in the business world. Ken Blanchard, wasn't a, he wasn't a Christian. And he sat across from a pastor up in Chicago, and they, had, they were having lunch together. And this pastor began to describe to Ken that it's, there's two words that are really important, do and done. See, most of us have this misconception, it's what I do that saves me. And so he explained on a napkin, in that, in, on that table, he said, we try to do this to, get, to gain favor with God or salvation. He said, it's not the word do, it's the word done. And then he explained to him, it's what Christ has already done. The work has been completed. Amen. And so he didn't realize this, this was working on Ken, and so nothing happened that day. 
But a few years later, a couple of years later, this pastor gets a call from Quinn Blanchard. And here's how he says, pretty cool how he said, he said, I've joined the team. And Bill's like, what are you talking about? Because I think he probably forgot the lunch, right? It's a couple of years later. And he goes, no, this whole, that whole do versus done thing, I get it now. And I've placed my faith in Christ, and I've joined the team. I'm on Team Jesus now. Come on, somebody. Give God praise today. Folks, this could be you today. You don't have to wait two years. If you'll realize and acknowledge the pi- price that was paid for you, You can walk in righteousness today. You can walk in fellowship and communion with a God who loves you. Do you believe that this morning? If you do stand.